Should I get ready and go? Yes. Yes. Here we go. It is a long one. I, I, I've been. We figured out it's been ten months since I ran a meeting here. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm making up for lost time. <laughs> All right, my discussion or talk tonight is on modern art, and I'm going to begin by defining my terms, as most people should. Uh, here's a G.K. Chesterton quote, to be modern is to be dated. <laughs> And I think it's becoming f more and more fair to say that when we think of modern art, we're really talking about 20th century art. Yeah. Um, Dadaism and abstract expressionism and cubism, I don't think these have any potency with anybody anymore. I think they had a real shock value when they first started. I think it, they're pretty much had their day. That's not to say that they're not going to be with us for a long time, because they will be, and they'll continue to affect and infect our culture for a long time, <laughs> um, but I, I really think they're they're, they're going to be seen as a phenomenon of the 20th century. Also, um, there's a lot of modern art I like. For instance, I like surrealism in particular. So I, it's not just that I want to put down modern art. There's actually a lot of uh, value in some of it. Um, I more more want to put it in, into a cultural context and show how it has some kind of uh, relationship to the culture and even to religion, um, which you'll see as we go along. All right, so this was inspired by this book I read, Art and Crisis, by Hans Sattelmeier. I think that's how you pronounce his name. And he was an Austrian uh, art critic, art historian, art educator from uh, Austria, as I said, but he taught also in Germany. And uh, my parents had this book in their collection, and they were going through some old books. They started to read it, and I, both of my mother and father found it a little difficult going. He, he writes in a very heavy German style, and so they figured it was something that I would enjoy. They handed it off to me. And the first thing I noticed was that it was uh, published in 1958, which caught my attention because that's the year that I was born, but also because that's only halfway through the 20th century. And we tend to think of the 1950s as this idyllic time. This is before the 1960s hit, when everything went to hell. And he had already been writing for decades about how modern art was signaling a total collapse in our culture by that time, which I thought was pretty interesting. Okay, Now... I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. I'm going to start with a quote. It gives you a little sense of, of his style of writing. Art illuminates the deeper and more hidden spiritual strata of an entire age. Here we are beginning to deal with the zone of the unconscious, for the actual meaning of such forms is hidden from their creators. What he's saying is that every artist has a, um, a conscious intent of what they're trying to express when they create a work of art. But also, unknown to them, they're expressing larger cultural attitudes and mores. Chesterton agreed with this, and there's a great Chesterton quote that I could not find that says exactly the same thing. Okay, So the, the artists, if you've ever seen interviews with artists, they tend to see themselves as like prophet standing apart from time and oh, well I'm trying to you know comment on man's inhumanity to man and all this blah 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 right in, in reality they're just as much a victim of the culture as anyone else is so if you imagine culture as kind of like this big wave moving through time the artist is just uh, a drop of water in that wave he's being swept along like everybody else and his choice of uh, subject matter style color form everything in some way is going to reflect the culture of his times even when he's not intending to, even when he thinks he's being special and unique, he really isn't, okay? All right, well, Solomeyer says that Western civilization has had four phases. He said most uh, civilizations in the history of, world, of the world have had two phases 
a small handful, including uh, Western civilization, the ancient Greeks, I think you mentioned the ancient Chinese, have had three phases. But only Western civilization has achieved this fourth phase, which is modern art. Now, that's not to say that other cultures haven't had some form of modern art, but only in so much as that they have copied us, kind of like, you know, the Japanese have Elvis impersonators, but they don't, you know, Elvis is a product of the West, okay? Uh, it's the same thing with modern art. Modern art was a product of Western civilization. So, before we talk about the fourth phase, I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview of the first three phases of Western art. Okay, the first phase, which is 550 to 1150 AD. This would have been... It's, it's difficult for us to imagine art, how it would have been used at that time today. We think of art as like you go to an art gallery, or you pick up an art magazine, that type of thing. There were no art galleries in those days. Art was, uh, it was primarily, the, the primary patron of the arts was the church. And it was used uh, to express the values of the society. I don't want to necessarily say it was like propaganda, because propaganda implies uh, like a conspiracy kind of thing. But it, it, it uh, helped to solidify the whole cultural attitude of the time. The primary patron, as I said, was the church. The emperor or the palace would have been the secondary patron of, of, of art. But it served, even the, the palace had the same uh, desires in mind as far as a peaceful, uh, stable society, and art was uh, a way of, of helping to solidify that. So you've probably seen examples of this kind of art Okay, Byzantine style. In fact, I think you brought in a quote a few months ago. Um, this is mosaics were very popular, and um, the style of this was very two-dimensional, which is something that in your quote that you brought in about Chesterton, you, you comments on. And the, uh, the temptation is to think, well, okay, well, it's just because they hadn't developed art enough yet. This is all they could do was two-dimensional art. Well, that's not really true, because remember, the ancient Greeks came before this, and they had some of the most highly developed statues uh, sculptured in the history of the world. So they were certainly aware of three-dimensional art. But this was the kind of art that they chose to use to express the values of the time. And when I say chose... I don't mean that they necessarily got together and had a convention. This is this is where artists do what they do without even realizing what they're doing. It was just just the way that artists expressed themselves was in two dimensions. The reason for that, according to Salomeyer, was that um, their emp the their focus was on the next world. It was not on this world. So, you know, Christ, God had come into this world to die for us so that we could go to heaven. So the emphasis was on heaven. It was on the next world. Well, how do you depict heaven? Heaven is not of this dimension. So a two-dimensional uh, depiction transports your mind into a different dimension other than the one that we're living in. Okay? And in fact, this kind of art survives till, you know, today in Eastern iconography. Iconography is often called a uh, window into heaven because the idea is that you look at this iconography, which is two-dimensional, it's not of this world, and that your mind is somewhat transported into another dimension. That's kind of what's going on there. Okay, and you, as I said, you've probably seen this kind of thing. Typically, with some exceptions, uh, the, the subject matter would be uh, the risen Christ, uh, heaven, um, the communion of saints, you would never have seen, for instance, a crucifixion, the suffering of Christ. That would have been too worldly. That would have been too much about this world. Okay, It's all about uh, the next world. Although you will see exceptions. I mean, here's Mary holding a child, for instance. And I think there's one of the three kings here. Okay, But it all has this uh, two-dimensional quality. You don't see any depth perception. You don't see any perspective. another thing that Chesterton noticed that um, Far Eastern art 
like a Buddha and that kind of thing, tend to depict them with their eyes closed. Uh, Christian saints were depicted in this era always with their eyes wide open, which is an interesting uh, observation, I thought, by Chesterton. But nonetheless, a very distant look. They're not really in this realm. That's kind of the thing to remember about this. (coughs) Now, there was some uh, sculpture... Uh, but not the way we think of sculpture as like uh, Michelangelo's David, which would, you know, you could be in the middle of the room, three-dimensionally, you could walk all around it. Um, now, do Eastern churches still forbid sculpture? Do we know, uh, Orthodox? I know uh, Byzantine Catholics, they don't have any. Sculpture. Right. It's still all icons. So that's kind of a holdover of this, this whole idea. Although, you know, there was some sculpture, but you can see from this, it was more what they call frieze sculpture, which is, they would have a flat piece of stone against a wall, and they would carve into that. So it would be flat up against the wall kind of thing. Okay. Here's a very typical frieze from that era, the Romanesque. This would have been like above the doorway of a of a church. Okay. And this is probably one of the most famous Uh, images from that time period. It's also a mosaic, which is flat pieces of stone. Okay. First phase down. All right, second phase. Second phase, the Gothic. Now, this is what begins to happen here, uh, and you notice the time period, is that there starts to be a cultural awareness of, well, okay, God came into this world to save us so we can go to heaven. But there must be something pretty good about this world for God to come into this world. There must be something pretty lovable about us lowly human beings for God to want to save us and go through all this trouble in the first place. There must be something pretty special about human beings for God to actually become a human being. So it was kind of a humble awakening, and I would stress the word humble, humble awakening that you know we're pretty special, this world is pretty good. There's got to be something sacred about this world, too, not just the next world. Okay, so this actually began to be expressed in art. Now, this is a picture by Giotto, and I chose this one first because this is a picture of St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis, although he wasn't an artist, his life after his conversion very much personifies the mood of this of this time period. He was grateful for everything. He was grateful for the grass. He was grateful for the trees. He was grateful for poverty. He was grateful for the lepers. He was grateful for everything. And it summarizes uh, this new attitude of, of, a, of a new awakening about the value of this world. Okay, The painter, and this would have been a, um, a fresco, which is a painting on a, on a plaster wall, uh, it was Giotto, who was really the pioneer in a new way of painting, which tried to depict uh, this world more accurately. Now remember, we're still talking about paintings, which are by nature a two-dimensional format. So now you have a challenge of trying to make an illusion of three dimensions in a two-dimensional format. So they begin uh, uh, using... A, what's, what's the... Uh, What's the process like? Is it called chiaroscuro? Do you know that term? Have you ever heard of that? But that's the actual name of, of the sh- using of shading and modeling to try to make uh, figures look more three-dimensional. Okay? And here's a good example of this. This is uh, a detail from the Lamentation of Christ. And you'll see there's a lot more shadow, there's a lot more roundness, modeling of the figures. But you'll also notice that in the first phase, all the figures were kind of like paper dolls all lined up, you know. Now you actually see more realistic, more human arrangement of the figures. Also, you're seeing real expressions on their faces, okay, which you you would not have seen in phase one, which was very placid, very distant, okay, very much an emphasis on this world. So, Giotto is really the, the pioneer 
uh, in this new style of painting. Here's another one by Giotto, and why I chose this, what's interesting about this, is that he's, he's doing very well showing the three-dimensional quality of the human beings, but you'll notice his perspective and proportions are still kind of off. Okay, this, is a, this would have been a gate in the wall of Jerusalem. Clearly, in reality, that would be much, much larger. Okay? Hmm. And this is part of what makes Giotto's painting so charming, on one hand, because he's kind of caught between the two phases. He's still stuck in the old habits of phase one, but he's trying to break free, and it kind of, it kind of has a charming quality to it. He's really lifelike looking people in these cut out backgrounds, you know. So it's, it's a really kind of cool thing. Right. Now, this is one of my all time favorites. This is Fra Angelico. And some people say Frangelico, it's Fra Angelico. Fra meaning brother. He was, in fact, a Dominican friar. The Fra Angelico, yeah. And he did a lot of religious paintings, obviously. And in particular, he did a lot of uh, Annunciation paintings. Uh, some of them look almost exactly like this. He must have, you know, they didn't have any way of mass producing, so he would just make copies over and over of the same thing. Uh, but this is the best one of them that, that I like. And what I like about this, first of all, if, if you think about the mood of this era, this sort of humbleness, it's almost impossible to tell who's being more deferential here. Is it the angel or is it Mary? Certainly the angel has a bended knee, uh, a bowed head, sort of a nervous expression on his face, but then Mary is also bending, bowed head, and she has a kind of a nervous expression on her face. So you almost expect her to be saying, like, you know, who me? You know, I mean, she's very, she's humble about this whole thing. And, um, which is very much the mood of, of the medieval thing. Later on in the Renaissance, uh, there would be paintings of the Annunciation where Mary would be depicted much more regally, you know, like much more in control of the situation. But here she really is the handmaid of the Lord, okay? Um, what's also interesting about this is you see that Fra Angelico is a little more advanced in his use of perspective. He's, he's getting that down a little better than Giotto did, okay? Which brings up a very interesting point that um, the whole art of, per, of perspective, I mean, how do you make something look three-dimensional, uh, particularly buildings and that sort of thing? You know, when we look at things in reality, the further away they are, the smaller they get and that sort of thing. Well, that took time to figure that out, and it actually took Euclidean geometry to figure that out. Now, we live in a time period where um, we think that all of, we're told, that all of the different schools of thought are supposed to be hermetically sealed off from one another. You know, you, you don't mix science with religion, and you don't mix art with math and all this kind of stuff. That, would have, that idea of separation would have been foreign to people in medieval times. Uh, the whole idea of the university was born in med medieval times because the idea was that all truth is harmonious. Okay, All truth is symphonic. And every truth that you learn, regardless of what field it is in, helps to illuminate other fields of learning. Okay, That's what a university was all about. You became a complete thinker. Okay, So here's a perfect example of how artists were actually using advanced math to figure out how to paint pictures and art of religious th themes. You know, you have like three overlaps there, and that was just perfectly natural and normal, as it should be. Later on in the Renaissance, you'd have people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, who would actually be cutting up cadavers in order to better understand the human anatomy, the muscle structure, bone structure, so that they could better render uh, human beings on canvas, okay? So they'd be engaged in science. Here's another one by Fra Angelico. You can see he's very proud of the way that he's figured out his uh, vanishing point. He, he uses a lot of uh, architecture that's receding into the distance, that kind of thing. Again, just to show the, the the attitude of humility and humbleness that was very common 
in this medieval Gothic era. It's particularly nice, that one. This is one by Masaccio. And what I like about this is, is just how real it is. I mean, you got this guy here with the bald head and the bozo, the clown kind of haircut, you know, and the lame leg. The woman, you know, the bare-butted kid here. And, and, and I think this is, I'm, I don't know, maybe this is St. Peter and St. something walking through the streets of uh, uh, Jerusalem or something. I don't know what it is. St. Peter and St. John. That's what I thought, St. John, because uh, he has no beard, right? But you'll notice, for instance, that uh, he's got his arm out here, and it's covering up the face of this guy here. Now, that we know when we t take pictures, that kind of stuff happens all the time. That's what the way real life is, right? In the first phase of art, you would never have seen something like that. Everybody would have been lined up like cookie cutters and, and very straight on. But now they're really making an effort to depict life as it, as it really is. You're seeing pe parts of people's faces getting cut off all over the place. Okay, So it really is an effort to uh, really depict life as, as we uh, see it every day. There was also an emergence of uh, sculpture that began to break away from the wall. And I chose this one because it actually looks like these guys were stuck on a wall and they, they broke away and they're giving each other a high five. Like, you know, thank God we're not on that wall anymore. Kind of thing, you know? Crows, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which one? The Masaccio. It was by Masaccio. Yes. Right there. I was thinking about the. I wonder if that was an implication of the devil or Satan who's hidden always in the background, trying to. Oh, I assumed it was a bishop, but I didn't. Both could hold true. Pretty red looking. No, maybe a cardinal. He is red. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that much about the painting. Yep. Right. The halos are not straight on. They're, it's like they're carrying them around like that, you know? <laughs> All right, let's see. That's a beautiful sculpture from that time period. Again, look at yeah. Mary and the humility, okay? Oh, yeah. Humbleness. Okay, the third phase before modern art. The Renaissance and the Baroque, 1470 to 1750, the God-man. Now what happens here is that the idea of humbleness and humility sort of goes away. <laughs> and the new attitude is that, uh, you know, hey, you know, all of this was done for us, you know? The whole universe was made for us. God came into this world for us so that we could be in heaven with him. It was this, this sense of that man is almost divine. The God-man, the man-God. God became man. I think even a saint said that. Uh, they meant it metaphorically. God Maybe Frank, man, so, man, so man could become man. God. You know. Yeah. And it seems like this period lasts longer than the other two. The, the Renaissance? This one, yeah. Well, particularly, he, uh, he actually breaks it up and talks about the Baroque. Actually, his specialty... Uh, Sadlmeyer was in Baroque architecture, so there's a long part of this that's in the Baroque, but I combine them both here because um, it's really, it really, the Baroque is really just an extension of the Renaissance. But it's all about the majesty of man, the greatness of man, the humility is gone, but the, but the reason that man is great, don't forget, is because of his friendship with God. It's not, he's not on his own, it's not because he's great on his own, it's because God is his friend and God has lifted him up and, and you know it's it's all still ordered towards God now this is one of the more famous uh, Michelangelo uh, one of the more famous um, images from this era 
and we've all probably seen this, this is in the Sistine Chapel. This is not on the ceiling, although ceiling paintings became huge during the Renaissance, which is compatible with this idea of man being lifted up, okay? Uh, but this is actually uh, behind the altar in the Sistine Chapel. It's a detail of a huge work, which is uh, The Last Judgment. Uh, the detail is op often called just Christ the Judge. And we've seen this so often that we may overlook just how what, what is so stunning about this. In fact, our, our Pope, Pope Benedict, commented on this a few years back. And that is, prior to this, Jesus would have been depicted as a Palestinian Jew with a long beard and with probably a burlap robe and sandals. <laughs> right, exactly. But now we're into this this renaissance, the God-man, the man-God, and and Christ, the risen Christ, is depicted as a superhero, almost like as Apollo. He has no, he's clean-shaven, short hair, and a, this tremendously powerful body. This is this is the mood of the age. Okay, the ex, you know the powerful man, the exalted man, the divine man. Okay. Yes. So that'd be kind of like, in a way, um, like a gruff evangelization towards people that were still, like, thinking, you know, Caesar, that kind of thing in their head, like in their face, kind of thought. Well, you know, what I mean? you know, again, how much of that, how much of it is conscious on the part of the artist, and how much of it is not, I don't know. But the point is, he's obviously drawing upon. Uh, he would have been drawing upon certainly <coughs> pagan ideas, you know, of, of you know Mount Vesuvius kind mm. of <laughs> kind of thing, right. you know. Um, but it seemed appropriate, so you know what I'm lost. saying, for for the idea. Another interesting thing yeah. is that uh, Jesus in the Last Judgment looks like Adam here. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he used the same model. Um, <laughs> I think he, no, he didn't. So, so maybe, maybe the original model was now the, the old man God here. Who knows? Right. <laughs> 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 no, but you're right. It is. Uh, I've heard someone say that the picture of God looks like the cross section of a brain. It is a cross section of a brain. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So now we have the uh, the creation of Adam. This is on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And you see in the Renaissance an explosion of new paintings. Now we live in a in a sexually perverted time period. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for any artist today to paint a nude without it having some kind of sexual connotations. It's it's almost impossible because our eyes have been ruined by the times in which we live. <coughs> Believe it or not, nudity during the Renaissance was seen as a sign of purity in the sense that a child is born into the world naked, pure, undefiled. So nakedness was actually seen as truth and purity, uh, a sense of undefiledness. Okay, And there was also a great emphasis on perfecting the human body as another sign of our near divinity. Okay? Kind of you got, kind of what they do, you got nothing to hide. Exactly. You don't have to wear it. Yep. You can, that was the whole thing with Adam and Eve. Was why, why are you wearing that stuff around your waist? Are you to hide? That's a very good point. <laughs> um, this is a famous sketch by Leonardo da Vinci, which would have been during the Renaissance. Again, the perfection, the actual mathematical perfection of the human body. Again, uh, science, math, art, religion, all coinciding without it. And nobody's getting their nose bent out of shape about it. We had the, uh, the creation of Adam. And we have here the... Um, the birth of Venus by Botticelli. Now, this is the first picture that I've shown that isn't uh, specifically Christian, which brings up an interesting point because during the Renaissance there was a great rise in secular art. Now, remember the church had been certainly during the first phase was the primary patron of the arts. Um, in the Renaissance, the church was still a great patron of the art. 
the palace uh, royalty was a great patron of the art. In fact, there was a great rise in the building of palaces, like great, the really great palaces of the world, like Versailles and that kind of thing. Because again, this greatness of man, and he needed a great house to live in, and all this kind of thing. But also, beauty in itself became a patron of the art, if you want to call it that. You began to have art for beauty's sake. We hadn't yet gotten to the point of art for art's sake, which is what modern art is a phrase they often use in modern art, but art for beauty's sake. And um, it kind of reminds me of, you were mentioning C.S. Lewis. We all know that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien had a bit of a disagreement in the sense of, of how they should write. And C.S. Lewis tended to, his uh, fiction tended to be very direct allegories of the Christian narrative. So in Narnia, the lion is Christ. You know, it's a very direct relationship there. Whereas Tolkien painted with a broader brush, and, and he essentially said, look, it, as long as the concepts are pointed in the, in the same direction, in the right direction, like concepts like good triumphing over evil, it doesn't matter if you're directly reflecting the Christian story, as long as it's ordered properly. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. This is, this is a scene from pagan mythology. But it, it's compatible because it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's about, again, the perfection of the human body. Uh, I remember what was it, Roger Scruton talked about this, particu- this painting in particular and how Botticelli actually you know, was in love with this model and wanted to be buried at her feet. It wasn't a sexual thing. He, just, he was just enthralled with her beauty. So even, you can even have pagan themes that are not an affront to Christianity, if you understand what I'm saying, because they're still pointed in the proper direction. Later on in modern art, we'll see what happens when you point in the other direction. I think, though, you, um, you do see the beginnings of a split between educated class art and the you know, peasant sensibility. Because I know for a fact that during this, this period, the uh, visitors from the sticks of northern Europe came down to Italy and saw this stuff in Rome were profoundly shocked by it. I'm sure. They were still living in the Middle Ages where the saints were always fully clothed and they humbled. Them. Exactly. Yeah. So they saw this and it they didn't comprehend it at all. So there's a split now. Yep. The and there's also, remember, it was during the Renaissance that you had the Protestant Reformation. And I don't really get into that here, but he does a little bit in, in the book because remember, the Protestant Reformation, particularly the early uh, uh, figures in that, Luther and Calvin, was all about the degradation of man, which is really just the opposite of what the Renaissance was, the Catholic Renaissance, which is all about the majesty of man. So you had painters like Bruegel, uh, probably the most famous of the Reformation era Protestant painters who painted lots of peasants and, and, and that sort of thing, almost, you know, a, a sense of just the opposite of this, okay? Just as a, to give you an example, here's uh, an Annunciation, a Renaissance version. Now you've got Mary living in a palace. And, uh, of course, she's standing, and this angel is trying to get her attention, and she could, you know, it's like, huh? <laughs> she says, leave me alone. <laughs> Make an appointment. <laughs> Make an appointment. <laughs> you know, there's people up here saying, what's that angel doing? There's one that's not quite as haughty, but... Uh, it's interesting. The angel is saying, I'm not worthy. <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh, here's another ex- This is Raphael. I love that one. And this is, uh, this, what is this, the School of Athens, I think it's called. You know, again, so you have a pagan theme, but it's still about the majesty of man, okay? And uh, the triumph of man, mind, body, architecture, beauty, all of this. 
So even though it's not specifically Christian, I guess if you were to take a Tolkienian <laughs> view of things, it would still be compatible. Uh, you had, as I said, the palace was a new patron. The church, of course, was the original patron. Beauty was a patron. You just had rich people now <coughs> hiring artists to paint their picture. The idea of portraits, or, or especially self-portraits, was not really thought of before the Renaissance. You know, uh, the, the most famous portrait of this era, of course, is the Mona Lisa. But again, we don't even really know who she was, which kind of tells you that the, the 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 most important patron was beauty. It wasn't this person, you know, or whoever paid him to, to paint this. It was beauty in itself became a goal, and that was for anybody who missed that Roger Scruton uh, uh, thing. He talked. That's what his whole uh, documentary was about: the importance of beauty. This is one of the favorites in our house is Vermeer, who was Flemish, a Flemish painter. I don't think anybody knows who this girl was, right? No. The girl with the pearl earring. They have written made movies and written books mm-hmm. about her. But the emphasis is just beauty. This is called the milkmaid. Now, the, yes. um, this, would have, this would have been the Northern Renaissance, which, you know, on very into the difference between the more the Italian and the Southern approach, and you know the Northern kind of stayed in a sense more humble. You're right. Because the Southern was more these very kind of semi-divine, right, pagan gods right. and all that. Whereas, right, right. And, 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 and so much of the and so much of the Renaissance was a rediscovering of <coughs> pagan literature and that kind of thing, which obviously influenced it. Okay. Does he touch upon like the uh, in the eighteen hundreds the romantic theory at all? Well we're gonna get into that. <laughs> and now of course uh, sculpture uh, again really fully comes into its own in this time time period. Finally made it off. And uh, rivals and even surpasses every anything that the Greeks did. Detail again, uh, Michelangelo's David. You know, again, the majesty of man, the beauty of man. Some people think this is this is the Pietà. This is, some people think this is the greatest statue on earth. I, I think I would agree with that. I even put a detail here just to show you. He was like what, twenty years old? I mean, what is it, twenty-five? I mean, where where does that come from? comes from God. That's amazing. You know? That's just amazing. Now, Seldemeyer says that this is actually when modern art began, 1750. He says modern art began at the French Revolution. Gee, how many times have we heard that the French Revolution was the beginning of everything. doesn't mean it was specifically French, but something was happening in the world at that time which everything started to go haywire. Okay? And at the end of this, I'm going to talk about reasons, what was happening that made things go haywire. So he says that the fourth phase actually begins <coughs> around this time period, but then he goes on to say that this time period, 1750 to 1900, was really a transitional stage. So that's the way I'm going to treat this. And that uh, he he said that there were all these warning signs of what was coming. I've selected four here that I thought were the most interesting. Okay, now now we're getting into some interesting stuff. The rise of the landscape. This is also something that Roger Scruton mentioned a little bit in his documentary. Now, you might say, well, what's wrong with the landscape, right? Landscapes are nice, beautiful things. And in that sense, okay, it's, it's, it's beautiful, so it's still ordered towards God. But something has radically changed. Remember, we just left an era where man was shaking hands with God. Where's man now? He's this little, tiny, teeny ant, and nature is suddenly 
the center stage is the is the star of the show. Okay. <laughs> Teeny tiny little people. Okay. And what's really going on here, and we'll talk about this more later, is the rise of deism. The and Newtonian science, the idea that uh this awareness of the vastness of the universe, that the universe kind of is like this giant machine, in a sense, and, and, a, and a, weird, a sense that, well, okay, well, maybe there was a God, but he kind of set all this in motion, and human beings are really just a tiny little cog in this enormous machine, okay? It's almost comical. You almost wonder, why did they bother to put the little people in there? I mean, if you're so enthralled with the with the landscape, why would you put the people? And here's what, unconsciously, without knowing it, what the artist is saying is people, it's kind of putting people in their place. See how small you are, kind of thing. Okay? Now, landscape painting really exploded in England. And he, he makes an interesting comment. He says that every philosophical idea that fueled the French Revolution actually came from England. But he said that the French have always been more daring than the English, so they actually took their ideas seriously and started cutting people's heads off. <laughs> Whereas the English painted landscapes, you know? <laughs> now here's one where the animals are bigger than the person, you see. So not only did you have deism, but you also had uh, full-fledged atheism, and you had pantheism, the idea that nature is God, God is nature. Okay. Well, Steve, you know, the English were pretty good with a lot of heads up. Yeah, they, they were... Yeah, but the French invented an instrument to do it. <laughs> 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 That's right. Okay, so that's one of our warning signs. Here's a very interesting one. The rise of the melancholy. Now, what began to happen is that people be began to realize, even if not consciously, they began to sense that they were, in fact, losing something. That something was being lost here. Okay, what was really being lost was their faith. But there was suddenly in art a real sense of sadness. And so you get a lot of pictures like this. People staring at ships sailing away into the distance while the sun is going down. Very just sad, depressed pictures became really everywhere. Like this group there. Yeah, just like us. <laughs> okay. This would have been this would have been in the early 1800s, just to put this in context. Okay, <laughs> particularly uh, um, I, these pictures here. Anyway. This one uh, was actually in the book, and I found this very interesting. Is that a cross? That's a cross. Now the the um, the artist is a German artist named Friedrich. And he painted this as an altar painting. And it actually hangs, I think, still today in some German church behind the altar. And at first, you, you say, well, this is a very reverent picture. It's about our faith. It's hanging in a church. And my guess is that the artist himself thought that he was painting something very religious and, and respectful, which he was. But he can't help it. It's infected with the mood of the day. You do not have a crucifix in a town square surrounded by children and mothers and fathers and pilgrims. What do you have? You have the symbol of our faith stranded on top of a lonely mountain with the sun going down with nobody there to see it. That's pretty sad. Pretty uh, appropriate. To okay. There's a prophet, that's all. This one is another one by Friedrich. Here you, here you have... You have the ruins of a, the ruins of an abbey. You have monks processing sadly through the art broken arches in a cemetery in the middle of winter. I mean, you want to talk about <laughs> imagery of like it, you know? It's yeah, it's a real downer. Fifteen minutes of that, you're right. Yeah. Now this is uh, 
This is an interesting thing here. Uh, Salomeyer said that even in the darkest ages of art, there was always people who were trying to keep the flame burning. Okay, And one such uh, school of artists was called the Pre-Raphaelites. And the Pre-Raphaelites... <laughs> Who are, yeah, I like the pre Raphaelites. We, like, we, we like the pre Raphaelites. They actually traced the decline all the way back to Raphael. Thus, their name, the pre Raphaelites. They wanted to make pictures again about man being this, the center of the picture. Notice that we just had these landscapes and these moody things with just sort of these misty things where people were really tiny in them. They wanted man to be central again, and they also wanted art to be about something, okay? So that you would say, oh, that's a scene from such and such a story, or whatever, as opposed to just these moody pictures, okay? And some of their pictures were uh, specifically Christian, but they drew a lot upon, uh, upon uh, a lot of mythology, but in particular they did a lot of, like... Um, Arthurian legends, you know, King Arthur, that sort of thing. Yeah, they, but, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, they, they tried to actually find some new material to work with. So they did a lot of poets from the preceding centuries, and like you said, the Arthurian legends. But they wanted a subject matter right. to actually give the art life again, okay? Because they, they sensed there was a crisis going on. But even the pre Raphaelites, again, were victims of their own age because you can still see that their pictures have a certain kind of melancholy quali quality to them yeah. which they're not even aware of when they're painting them. Wow. Okay, so they're even they're being swept up in this whole melancholy mood of the age. <laughs> That's a lady in the lake, I think. Ophelia. Ophelia. Of course, that's what I meant to say. The lady in the lake, the one with the sword? Yes. All right, thank you. Yeah. Rise of the Cartoon. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. We've grown up with cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons and Sunday paper cartoons and that kind of thing. And they're going to tell us they're Satanists. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is there was a time period where, you know, there, weren't, there really weren't cartoons. Cartoons really began in the 1700s as a whole uh, branch of art. The whole idea of using art to lampoon man, to make fun of man, began around the time of the French Revolution. That would not have been thought of to actually... Remember, the Renaissance was all about man was practically divine, okay? And now man is going to be lampooned in art. And that really began at that time period. Here's a picture of takeoff on Pygmalion. And what I found interesting about this, I don't think Salomeyer picked up on this, but during this time period, the 1700s and 1800s, the cartoons are still all pen and ink. <coughs> okay? It's almost like they don't have the guts yet to commit the lampooning of man to the more serious uh, medium of oil paints and, and canvas. It's almost... They're hiding. It's almost like kids at the back of the classroom snickering and throwing spitballs. It, and so it's easier to do that with a pen and ink quick drawing but to actually paint a big picture saying man is a buffoon, that takes a lot of guts. And they weren't, they weren't really quite ready to do that yet. So it was all this pen and ink stuff. Okay, but the image of man is now become a buffoon. And here's a guy who obviously had some kind of authority in showing what kind of an idiot he is. Okay. And the fourth warning sign, the rise of the demonic. And this is really, truly bizarre. Towards the end of the 1800s, artists began to actually depict demonic themes, just out-and-out out demonic themes. It was almost as if they sensed that something had been released into the world, something evil. They knew this instinctively, and it was coming out in the art all over the place. So you began to see stuff like this. This would be like a Victorian woman. Notice she's in white. She's sleeping, but her nightmares are coming to life. 
and you see a lot of this theme of people sleeping and night nightmares actually coming to life. So you have a goblin actually sitting on her, or some kind of godfather, to, you know, horse's head floating above her. <laughs> okay. That's a nightmare. Um, this one's by Goya. And, uh, yeah, he, actually, Salomai was a huge fan of Goya. He thought his images were very disturbing, but he, he, he thought he was a genius. And uh, the caption that uh, Goya himself put here was, when reason sleeps, monsters are born. So, again, this idea that nightmares are coming to life. You get the feeling something bad is coming, right? That's, that's a Goya picture. Saturn devouring his children. Isn't that like... I mean, that's really... That's <laughs> really disturbing. Isn't that like some, some of the visions of hell, though, too? Yeah. Like the, the, the demons, what they do to the so damned? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at this. This uh, The artist who did this, I, I can't remember the name, but... My daughter Emma told me about this artist. It's actually mentioned in the novel Tessa the Durbervilles, the artist who painted this. But here's a woman who has killed her children, has cut them up, cooking one of them here, and has this demonic smile on her face. I mean, can you imagine in the Gothic or Renaissance... Now, remember, we don't think of this as modern art because it's still representational. It's realism. It's not like it's abstract expressionism or something. But clearly, the fact that they're now feeling comfortable painting this stuff, <coughs> something something has gone wrong. That would have been late 1800s. If I come out of this <laughs> well, he would have been one of the guys keep trying to keep the flame burning. One of the uh, one of the ignored ones. So ugly critter. This is the guy who really disturbs me. If <laughs> if you. If Ensor is his name. He was Belgian. Do a Google search for Google images for Ensor. I, I almost wanted to vomit looking at some of this stuff. And it's not because it's blood and guts. It's just that it's demonic. It's very strange stuff. What are they eating? I don't know. It almost look like each other's tongues or something. This is called Masks Confronting Death. Yes, yeah, it's just very demonic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the occult right there. Okay. Very disturbed stuff happening. Okay, the fourth phase. Finally, we're into mo real modern art, the 20th century. Okay. Um, now, the first thing I want to say about 20th century art is that the myth that's been perpetrated on everyone is that this is that modern art is just the natural progression of art. Okay, this is just, the, you know, just our tastes have changed over time, and this was just the natural progression of art. That's a lie. That's a total, absolute, utter lie. Everything progresses, okay? Art, music progresses, but it, if it's a natural progression, it builds upon what came before it. Just like when a tree grows, the trunk stays there, and branches come out of it. The trunk doesn't disappear, okay? So, a Every stage of art prior to that had been a natural progression. So, again, if you think of culture, as I was saying before, as a wave going through time, sort of building in strength and, and mass, what happened in the 20th century, it didn't just continue to grow. It's almost as if it smashed upon a reef of rocks and just went in every conceivable direction. Okay? It was not a natural progression. That's the big myth that they want us to think, that people naturally start, started changing their uh, taste in art. What? I have a theory about that. It's a little off because it's not quite the right theory, but I honestly believe that World War One had a lot to do with that, especially the music. I would entertain that. I can't prove it, but I really get that feeling. Now... I'm going to start here with a G.K. Chesterton quote. Not really. Christianity is common sense. And I can't remember what the context was when he said this. But if you think about it, Christianity, which had dominated all culture and all art up until this point, uh, 
Christianity gives a, a, an intelligent explanation of life, to the deepest questions of life. Who is God? Why are we here? What is sin? What is all this about? There's lots of other religions that might... Well, if you take the pagan religions, you know, they might say, okay, well, the sun is a guy on a chariot. And, and, and to some degree, that must have satisfied people. At least it was an answer. And it was artistic. But even, as Chesterton said in uh, The Everlasting Man, even the pagans really didn't believe it. <laughs> you know, they liked it. It was, it was somehow satisfying. It was part of their tradition, part of their family storytelling. But when they would come in contact with other cultures, they'd swap their their myths and they would join them together and they'd give theirs up and it, it really wasn't a, a true explanation for life or you would have movements uh, such as the Stoics which uh, Chesterton talks a lot about you know who had a list of uh, ethical behaviors that were proper and that's that's great but it doesn't explain why we're here it doesn't explain who God is it doesn't explain much of anything beyond that or the Buddhists who have uh, insights such as um, uh, that all unhappiness comes from desire. So if you get rid of desire, you won't be unhappy. Well, that's a nice self-help tip, you know. But that doesn't explain why we're here. It doesn't explain much of anything. But Christianity actually has an explanation to life and to the biggest, most important questions of life. You know, is there a God? Who is this God? What kind of God is he? Why are we here? What's the whole thing all about? So, it's, Christianity is common sense. Christianity is right thinking. Christianity is the truth. And when a, when a society is imbued with this truth, they are, they're thinking properly. It's like all their pistons are firing the way they're supposed to be. And everything that they do will be a fruit of, of that right thinking. There's not, it's not a mistake that Western civilization shot ahead of all the other civilizations on Earth. It's because their minds were properly attuned to the truth. Uh, now, when you start to lose that, you start to lose your right thinking. You start to lose your common sense. Or you actually start to lose your sanity. And that's uh, what uh, Seldemeyer says. Now, the loss of God as a reality destroys the original sense of reality as a whole. Having lost that sense, man turns into an anti-realist. Madness consists in the disturbance of one's apprehension of the real world. So if you reject truth and reality, in a sense, you're becoming mentally ill. Right? So, that's the way he looks at it, and he, he refers to it very often as the illness, and that mental, uh, that this mental illness is expressed through modern art, that modern art is actually uh, symptoms of this, of this uh, illness. Now, this is the one place I was a little dis... Uh, Disappointed in Saldemeyer because the guy's German or Austrian, and I figured, okay, he's going to have a good, organized Germanic way of organizing modern art for me. And I have, I'm half German, so you know, this is what I was looking forward to. When it came to actually having an organized assessment of modern art, I was disappointed because it was very scattergun approach. It was all over the place, and. Uh, until I started to put this together and I began to realize how difficult it is to organize modern art because, as he says, the overriding characteristic of modern art is that it's chaos, chaotic. So how do you organize chaos? It's very difficult to do. But what I've tried to do here is, is to organize his thoughts a bit. And the way I've done that is that if you think of attributes of God, think, things that are compatible with God, like I said before, the beauty at least is, is, is ordered towards God. If you're in a society that's in friendship with God, your art will reflect those various attributes that are ordered towards God. If you're living in a society that is actively rejecting God, 
the artist is going to shy away from those things that would remind them of God or turn them towards God, if that makes sense. Okay? The word that Saldemar uses is allergic. That the, the, uh, the artist actually becomes allergic to things that remind them of God. Okay? Again, probably not even thinking it through. Just will become allergic to them. So, for example, you'll see what I mean. Order becomes chaos. Order would be a characteristic you would associate with God. Every generation from the beginning of man looks at the, the patterns of the stars and the patterns of the sun, pattern of the moon, pattern of the seasons, and this points to an intelligent source. Okay? But if you're actively rejecting God, you're going to reject the concept of order. Orderliness is ordered towards an divine intelligence. So you begin to get this. That's beautiful. What's my first reaction? Just chaos. What happens when you put sprinkles on ice cream? They tend to start running. (laughs) 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 And this. Don't even waste your time. Don't even waste your time. Just the focus. Now this is by Jackson Pollock. Now I bet you you could find some writings from Jackson Pollock, and he would give you some very sophisticated reasoning as to what this is all about. But at the end of the day, a hundred years from now, when people when Jackson Pollock that name is no longer recognized, and people have no idea how much was paid for this. What are you left with? Garbage. You're left. You're left with chaos. That's all it is. And really, that's what he was expressing. Okay. These, by the way, when I did these Google searches for these images, you can select famous works of art. So, so all of these are famous. And they're in museums, right? And they're in museums, and they cost a lot of money. I know what that is. It's a bunch of colors. We don't want that. I want that. <laughs> <laughs> they look great. Look, you know what's amazing is if, when I was in school, I get yelled at for doing that from mm-hmm. second or third grade. Huh. And, and then, you know, I sure a lot of it. But years later, you're, you're bringing them in. Now, this is one that. Um, oh, this is Salvador Dali. This was an interesting point that Salomeyer made was that even this depicts uh, a lack of uh, a turning away from the order of God. Gravity is part of the order of God. A lot of uh, uh, artists would depict these, in, in, particularly in uh, surrealism, these objects that couldn't possibly be held up by these stringy little things, okay? And they tried to do this in architecture, too. There became a, a fascination with trying to build things that had a smaller bottom than the top. Again, he said that this was actually a subconscious effort to actually overthrow the very laws of laid down by God as far as gravity. I thought that was kind of an interesting insight. So is that why... Is he holding cross, is he cross it's against it's that it's modality of thinking? Yeah. All right, another attribute, love. Everybody knows, right? God is love, okay? So the opposite of love, well, you might say hate, but in reality, the love is intense feelings, hate's intense feelings. There certainly is a lot of hate in modern art, but really the opposite of love, 180-degree opposite would actually be indifference, just total indifference. So how do you how do you depict indifference in art? And you see this sort of thing. <laughs> this is just nihilistic, random geometry. There's not even a mood to it. What is it? It's just it's it's just. And these are famous works of art. There isn't even symmetry to them. It's it's just randomness. <laughs> Just total, total indifference. <laughs> That's a famous word of art right there. 
You'd have, have more to drag them out. Exactly. I'm pretty sure they're trying to look outside. Actually, is there a feature if your paint swamps that you use in the house? What is that? Now, this is. This is an interesting one, and this is actually an outgrowth of uh, the cartoon. Now that we're in the 20th century, they're no longer just doing pen and ink drawings. Mm -hmm. Seriousness and dignity. Again, in Christianity, what are you dealing with? You're dealing with uh, life, death, judgment, heaven, hell, sin, redemption. These are very, very serious issues. These are the most serious issues in the universe. And the art of the Renaissance and, and, and all those other periods had a sense of seriousness and dignity about them. But if you're rejecting that, if you're actively rejecting that, it becomes the, the replacement is ridicule, cynicism, and casualness. Okay, so now we have just out and out ridicule of man, absurdity. Oh, it's a person. Two persons. That's what happens with Flamingo. It's a man who can notice. No, it's because those stupid uh, Easter Island Stoneheads are when they were flashy. Oh, right. Yeah. Even serious issues now become. This is a famous <laughs> Picasso <laughs> print. <laughs> and. When you think about it, uh, when you paint a picture, it takes a long time, as Liza knows. It's, and the very fact that a picture takes a long time to make means that it's something, you're doing something serious. But now that you, you just... Something like this becomes a major work of art. And obviously it was just whipped off in a few seconds. The implication is that it's, we're not really taking these things seriously anymore. It's not even worth the time to take it seriously anymore. When I first saw that, I thought it was a question. Oh, well, I guess in the literary field, like they say Paul wrote when he was on opium. And uh, I wonder if some of, these, some of these guys might be on something uh, while, they were, while they were painting some of those finer objects. I wouldn't know. I don't see a relation because Paul wrote some very beautiful stuff. Um, uh, I well, I know you don't think so. It's very, it's very depressing. No, I didn't say that. Said this is actually a, a picture of the crucifixion, believe it or not. It's Christ on the cross. But again, you have the cartooning effect. You have the casual sketchiness. Are those yellow submarines? Is this hands up on the cross? Oh, I see. I get it now. I have no hands. All right, this is interesting. Hierarchy becomes randomness and reductionism. Again, the Christian God, there's a sense of hierarchy. The master of the universe, Christ the king, the different levels of angels, all of this idea of hierarchy. Now, you can have art that is very specifically hier hierarchical. I suppose you could show a king on a throne, but that's not what I mean here. Hierarchy is just the way pictures had always been. You think of the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is what the picture is of. The background is the background. So there's a hierarchy there. The Mona Lisa is more important than the background. It's just common sense, right? But part of what happens for a couple of reasons in this new era is that there becomes this attitude that nothing is more important than anything else. Part of that is this new egalitarian idea from the French Revolution. Okay, who's to say something, somebody or something is more important than anything else? And also from uh, new scientific notions about atoms. For instance, I'm made of atoms, and this chair is made of atoms. So really, you see, we're just the same. I'm just the same as the chair which then transfers actually into a value judgment, I'm no more important than the chip. Okay? So it becomes reductionism. So what was just natural, normal way of seeing the world, like a kid paints a picture of his mother, the mother is what he's painting the picture of. Everything else, the flowers and everything, are less important. That now becomes a thing of the past. And this is really uh, where you see this in cubism. 
and you start to see the, the subject of the painting, what used to be the subject of the painting, being broken down and being absorbed into everything else around this. Cezanne, you were talking about the Cezanne beer or whatever it was? Yeah, I like Cezanne beer, though. <laughs> <laughs> but Cezanne was the first one to really do this, who, and he, was, he did it deliberately. He was trying to say, imagine you just woke up in the world and you didn't know that a bowl of fruit was what you were painting the picture of, and the fruit was just as important as the table, which is just as important as everything else. Okay. This is Matisse. And if you look at it carefully, everything's on the same plane. There's nothing, you don't even have a sense of, well, really, what am I supposed to be looking at here? Okay? So it's actually a return to the two-dimensional, which was abandoned centuries earlier. But now it's not to be a, a window into heaven. It's this idea that nothing is more important than anything else. It's the breakdown of hierarchy. <coughs> people kissing, but they're they're breaking down. Atomism, reductionism, people being act actually absorbed into the background. That was a stick figure. Bowl of fruit. So again, you know, perspective, the idea of depth is now disappearing. This looks like something was cut up and disassembled, which is very much in keeping with this idea. This is an easy one. Beauty becomes ugliness. Well, al almost all... 20th century art was ugly, so I mean, where do you stop here, right? <laughs> but I'll just give you a few examples. Many examples, there's so many. What the hell? What the? Deterrence. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea of making something ugly, d deliberately making something ugly, think about how stupid that is, but that, you know, that wouldn't have occurred to someone in the Middle Ages or in the Renaissance. Just, just deliberate ugliness. Life becomes death. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, how should I put this? Um, actually, this kind of reminds me of... Um, if you've ever seen the movie Jaws, you ever see the scene where they're down in the hull of the boat and uh, they're talking about, the, what was it, the Indianapolis that sank and everything, and they're all in the water. And uh, uh, um, the captain is, is, is saying... He's talking about the shark, and he's talking about the shark's eyes. Remember that at all? You should, you should watch that on YouTube. It's actually Steven Spielberg says that's his most favorite scene that he's ever filmed, and it really is riveting. And he says that he says something like a shark. He's got lifeless eyes. He's got black eyes. He's got. He looks like a doll's eyes. He doesn't even look like he's alive. It's very chilling the way he describes it. This idea of the black eyes. God is life, okay? So the opposite of life is death. And what you start to see, and this is, this is uncanny, absolutely uncanny. You start to look at modern art, 20th century art, and you, you see this, the deadening of the eyes. Now remember the milkmaid in the kitchen, working in the kitchen. A lot of uh, art critics will say, well, you see Picasso, he could do realistic paintings too. Here's an example. Okay, this woman is dead. She's a cadaver. There's a difference, okay? I remember uh, having a discussion once with a, a, an artist who's now fairly famous, Scott Pryor. I don't know if anybody's heard of him. But um, my brother used to own an uh, art gallery in Northampton. He used to have all of these uh, um, shows for up-and-coming artists. And I would go to these things when I was in my 20s and I would have a glass of wine and cheese and walk around and try to look smart. And I was talking to Scott, who's actually, you know, a friend of the family. And I said, explain something to me, Scott. I said, I'm a musician. And I said, music is, is actually all caught up in time. When you listen to a piece of music, you're actually going through time as you're listening to it. Or if you're watching ballet, they're moving through time. Or if you're reading a poem, there's a progression of time. I said, art 
doesn't. And yet it's still fascinating. I said, why, why is that? Why does art fascinate us even when it's not? And he said, sit down before you hurt yourself, Steve, and I'll explain it to you. And he, he, he said that real good art actually captures life. It captures a slice of life, just like music captures a slice of time. It actually captures life on film. Or not on film, on canvas. So like if you were to look at that milkmaid, you could actually imagine her looking up and doing something else. Uh, but what happens here in these things is that these people aren't alive anymore. And it's particularly the eyes, if you look at them. You begin to just see this deadness of the eyes, the shark eyes, the, the doll's eyes. becomes hugely... Uh, present. Hmm. Even in things that seem to be representational art, you would say, well, this doesn't look like abstract expressionism, but the people are dead. I've seen that uh, used intentionally in some art forms that I think are legitimate nowadays. Well, like, uh, I remember there was one guy who had, there was like, some kind of exorcism going on. And the demon's like ripping out of the body and like freaking out and all that, but its eyes are like that, it's totally shot black, no color at all. Right. Not even the reflection that's shining in it. That's Picasso too. That's Picasso. And again, that's one that they typically show to say, see, he could do representational art, but look at use the same cadaver. Yeah, but look look at that. That's a dead person. That's what that is. Dad likes it because of the guitar. Uh the sacred becomes the profane and I've decided that I'm not going to show any of this. <laughs> There's no point. Thanks. Okay, for us to be voyeuristic about that stuff. Now, I'm going to take one last little detour before I kind of get to the end of this. And this is my own spin on this, uh, because as I was reading the book, when I came, we already saw this picture. When I came across this picture, I was fascinated by this Ensor guy. This Ensor really just, just very disturbing pictures. And this one, as I said, is called Masks Confronting Death. And I got the sense that these masks aren't coming off. You know, there's something horribly wrong here. And so I became, I started thinking about masks and how people use masks. And I'm going to tie this all in with modern art. And you think about all the way, different ways human beings use masks in the world. So I've called this section the mask. This is my own thing. This has nothing to do with Salomari, so you can't blame him. For this. <laughs> now, of course, we have kids on Halloween. They wear masks. Nothing wrong with that, right? Innocent enough. But then here we have a guy using a mask to cover up his identity so he can commit sin, right? So he can rob people and do something bad without being recognized. Notice he hasn't put the mask over his left kneecap or over the third toe on his right foot, he puts it over his face, because it's, his, it's the face which we recognize. Uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> ben, this, this, pictures. You can't show these, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> this is either Ben or Kenny, I can't remember. No. <laughs> or me 20 years ago, I can't remember which is. But this is your this is your 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 archetypal guy with the uh, lampshade on his head again covering his face. Why? So he can act like a jackass. It's interesting how we cover our faces when we want to do stupid and lousy things, isn't it? Isn't it interesting how we keep covering our face? Here's a guy who has the job of cutting off people's heads. What does he do? He covers his face to make it easier for him to cut off people's heads. Doesn't cover his leg. Obviously, he doesn't wear a shirt even. <laughs> Right? <laughs> also, when we want to kill other people, it sure makes it easier if we cover their faces, doesn't it? Now, many of you may not know, you know what blackface is, but you may not know that this was actually a time-honored tradition in vaudeville, and the reason they used blackface was because they discovered that when people were starting out in, in the theater business, that they would have stage fright. But when they would paint their faces, they didn't have as much stage fright. It made it easier for them to go onto stage. And so they would, it was a tradition that for the first year or so that they had to wear blackface until they became comfortable in front of an audience and then they could wash it off. You didn't know that, did you? And of course, various cultures paint their face when they go to war. 
So it's easier to kill people. Well, it's kind of frightening, too, though. Okay. So how does this relate to art? Well, I'm going to use a quote from a book called the Bible. <laughs> God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Okay. We're talking about images, which is what art is all about. Okay. Now, I'm sure, what are there, four different levels of interpretation? Ben, you're the smart one about this. You have the literal and the analogical and all this kind of stuff. Now, we read something like this, and we, we our first inclination is you skip over the literal because obviously God is not a physical being and blah, blah, blah. But I, I, I wonder if it's more literal than we know. The Bible talks about seeing the face of God and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of very literal kind of references. And I don't pretend to understand it. But what I'm saying is that in some way, I think we more literally image God than we know. And I don't think it's our left kneecap that images God. I think there's something about the human face that reminds us of God. And that's why we have to cover up the human face when we act in an ungodly way because our face reminds us of the God who would not approve of what we're doing. Okay? Well, similarly, in modern art, if you have an entire culture which is turning away from God, as Saldemeyer says, they will become allergic to the human face because every human face is going to be like a, a little hand mirror reflecting God. They don't want to see that. So they're going to do whatever they can, and they'll use many of the devices we've already talked about, such as the deadening of the eyes, or the cartooning effect, or various things to obscure the human face, heaven forbid, that we might actually see the face of God in any human being, the image of God. So let's. So I'm not even going to stop on these. I'm just going to let you watch the almost ridiculous lengths that various famous modern artists have gone to to avoid painting the direct uh, face of uh, human face of man. <laughs> Sometimes through distortion. Where's Jamie on that one? If nothing else. Is it called shotgun moon? Yes. <laughs> I almost got it. That's disturbing. If you didn't say it, I wouldn't know that was the face. <laughs> you know, think of them all as masks. Oh. Oh. Hmm. Probably anti human. These people hate human beings. Yeah. <laughs> With a passion. <laughs> 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 Andy Warhol. Well, Except for Andy Warhol. <laughs> <laughs> but even that reminds me, I mean, this is, you know, he's painted her face. It's, it reminds me of, like, the, uh, the war paint. She looks out of the. She was out of the. Especially at the end. <laughs> Oh, no, no, that was annoying. Contraception. The contraception oh. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you saw that book? Yeah. Yeah, well, I own it. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. 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 used to be a common theme. All right. I'm almost done. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> Causes. So what, the, so what the heck caused this? What was this giant reef of rocks that the wave of culture crashed upon? Break down the thing. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you three things that I think. One, as odd as it sounds, was the rise of the art gallery. And this is something Saldemeyer talks about. We think, oh, an art gallery, that's great. You can go there, it's cultural, you see all these art. He says, first of all, the art gallery was an outgrowth of the egalitarianism of the French Revolution, the idea that nothing was more important than anything else. So you walk into the art gallery and you see a beautiful Flemish painting of a crucifix, and next to it is a bowl of fruit, a picture of a bowl of fruit. What is the implication? The implication is that a bowl of fruit mm -hmm. is no less important mm -hmm. than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This is all the egalitarian attitude, and that's when art galleries were born, was during the time of the French Revolution. 
also the very concept of, uh, of beautiful art and really ugly art being in the same building. We're supposed to take this all equally seriously. That's a false paradigm that's been forced upon us. And when I say the art gallery, I really mean academia. Okay? Academia became the new patron of the arts. It had been the church. It had been the palace. It had been beauty itself, art for beauty's sake. But now you had a bunch of atheistic, intellectual s snobs who were, in a sense, through the art gallery, controlling what would be seen and what would not be seen. There were great artists that were creating art all during, during these time periods, but they weren't playing the game, according to the people who ran the galleries and ran the art shows. So they just simply were ignored. You won't, you won't get heard of, and you will not be seen unless you play the atheistic game. And, just in case you don't believe me, this, this long wait is worth it just for this one quote. I have a quote here from Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso was the most famous modern artist of the 20th century. Now listen to this. From the moment that art ceases to be food that feeds the best minds, the artist can use his talents to perform all the tricks of the inte intellectual charlatan. Most people can today no longer expect to receive consolation and exaltation from art. The refined, the rich, the professional do-nothings, the distillers of quintessence, quintessence desire only the peculiar, the sensational, the eccentric, the scandalous in today's art. I myself, since the advent of Cubism, have fed these fellows what they wanted and satisfied these critics with all the ridiculous ideas that have passed through my mind. <laughs> the less they understood them, the more they admired me. Through amusing myself with all these absurd farces, I became celebrated, and very rapidly, for a painter... Celebrity means sales and consequent affluence. Today, as you know, I am celebrated. I am rich. But when I am alone, I do not have the effrontery to consider myself an artist at all. Not in the grand old meaning of the, world, of the word, Giotto, Titian, Rembrandt, Goya. We're great painters. I am only a public clown. I have understood my time and have exploited the imbecility, the vanity, the greed of my contemporaries. <laughs> it is a bitter confession, this confession of mine, more painful than it may seem. But at least, and at last, it does have the merit of being honest. Pablo Picasso, 1952. <laughs> now, every art class in the world should start with that quote. Okay? I will do that. Yeah. So that's yeah. is that title laughing all the way to the back? <laughs> <laughs> I would say another thing that was the cause that I touched on earlier was the rise in Newtonian science, which was part of what they call the Age of Enlightenment. <coughs> uh, this new w view of the universe that uh, it was kind of like a perpetual motion machine, or, or as uh, some have described it, like a giant billiard table where all the things are bouncing around and you can actually plot everything. Um, that was part of it too. I, I think all belief systems of man boil down to what does he believe about God, what does he believe about the universe, and what does he believe about man. That basically takes care of everything. Man, the universe, and God. Newtonian science brought into the world a radical new understanding of, of, of God and the universe. Um, thankfully, a lot of that is now dissipating since the advent of the Big Bang Theory, which kind of shattered that whole, a lot of that theory. Um, and then that only left our conception of man. And within a hundred years of Newton, we had Darwin, who uh, <coughs> proposed a radically different view of man. It's interesting to me that throughout history, uh, Satan is always depicted not as obliterating the good, but as inverting the good. That's why the symbol of Satan is the inverted cross. And if you think about what Newtonian science did, it took what used to be the most obvious evidence of God, the order of the universe, and flipped it on its head and saying, rather than being evidence of God, it's evidence now that we don't need God. 
because now the, the universe is so ordered it just runs itself. So what had been the greatest evidence of God now became the evidence of the lack of the need for God. Similarly with Darwin, you have an inversion. We had been made in the likeness and image of God. Now it becomes inverted. We're made in the likeness and image of beasts. Okay? In a sense, we, we had seen ourselves more like fallen angels. Now we were risen apes. It becomes exactly 180 degrees out of phase. The exact opposite. Just like Satan turns the cross upside down. And the combination of these two things happening within 100 years of each other, I think... Uh, really did a like, like a one-two punch in Christianity knocked it on its ass basically is what I think uh, let's see now predictions you might be interested in what he was predicting was going to happen 1958 he said there were essentially two major predictions at that time as far as where art was going and one, pre- one prediction was that this was it there was many who believed that this was signifying the end of Western civilization, that this was so disgusting and horrible what was happening in art that there was no, uh, there was no recovery from it. Is that Anna? There were, he, he tended to think that, uh, uh, that this fourth phase would end. It might take hundreds of years, but there would be a fifth phase. Personally, I think that the thing that they couldn't have seen because they were too close to it at the time, they couldn't have seen the rise of the information age. Uh, The idea of a bunch of intellectuals being able to tell us what style of art that we're supposed to look at now, it's it's kind of like the breakup of, of the big media. It's the same thing happening in the art world. They can't control it anymore. And I think people were just left to their own devices without experts telling them what to look at and what to buy. I think people will gravitate just towards what they like to see, which tends to be more beautiful art. So I, I'm a little more uh, optimistic uh, than Salomar in that. And then finally, hope. I'm just going to give you a few images here just to give you a sense of uh, what is happening now. There is, in fact, a resurgence of an interest in representational art or naturalistic art is what some people call it. These are contemporary artists doing work now. These are fairly well-known artists. Wow. Just beautiful, just beautiful work. Okay? A lot of them are rediscovering the actual methods of old, the old masters in order to do these. Okay? This guy, what is this person's name? Is it he or she? I can't remember. Is it he? He's kind of funny because he, it's almost like he's lampooning the modern art. He'll have these very realistic pictures, and then he'll, as a backdrop, he'll have some of this, these stupid modern art things. Here you have the old mod mobile. Almost has a halo. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of an interesting approach, and you see this cubist thing in the background. It's like. <laughs> She's like, give me a break. <laughs> I don't know this is a uh, this is a painting by an up and coming artist from Western Mass called Eliza. Was it Mosier? <laughs> I think the S is pronounced like a Z. She's German. <laughs> oh, Moser. Okay, yeah. Now this is something that Eliza Eliza did. She's nice. studying with a, a, a teacher who uh, has studied in Florence, Italy, and learning all the styles. Of, it's right. It's being displayed right now at what is it? American International College. Woo! And she got an award. Yeah. And the final image I'm going to show you here. And this, I'm just going to give you. I have no idea what the artist was trying to say here, but the way I see this is that you have a naked child here, similar to Adam being created or the birth of Venus and you notice that this child has been covered up for a long time with this translucent covering like the 20th century has been has been obscuring the image of man for a long time and this new child is being born like the birth of Adam the creation of Adam or the birth of Venus 
into the 21st century and is tearing back this this obscuring thing that has been covering up the image of man and the kid is saying I'm back there's a ghost child yeah it's very beautiful it's a great work of art and that's a contemporary work God's coming back to kick luck that's right and that's it folks Bravo.